Genesis 29. We're going to be talking about Leah and Rachel this morning. And um, Leah and Rachel, some of you may have never heard of these two women before, and some of you may have heard about them a lot. So I'm, I'm, this is a story that I've heard for a long time about these two sisters and um, thought I knew their story pretty well. But um, in studying for uh, this talk, I've learned some new things about them and kind of seen them in a different way. And so I hope to share some of that with you today. So anyway, let me pray and then we can start in Genesis 29. Jesus, thank you so much for um, another chance to just sit and to hear from you about your love for your daughters and um, for daughters that um, have a lot of things going on in their life. And um, open our eyes. We won't know anything about you unless you um, open our hearts and our eyes and um, allow us to hear you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Okay. So, um, Genesis 29. And we're going to kind of move a little bit slower through Scripture. So, um, y'all have a chance to, like, actually look at it and think for yourselves. Um, So I'm going to be asking a little bit more of your participation today. Um, I think it's good for y'all to have a chance to actually, like, look at the words of Scripture and have to think. So, um, because that's how you start to learn how to read the Bible. Um, So, first of all, what do y'all already know about Leah and Rachel? I mean, if you haven't heard about them, that's fine. But for those of you who have heard about Leah and Rachel before, what do you already know about them? They're sisters. They're sisters. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one's ugly and one's pretty. What else? I'll go ahead and say it. <laughs> what else? One is chosen. One is chosen. Yep, and one is not. What else? Is there anything else? One's nice and one's snotty. One's nice and one's snotty. Interesting. Interesting. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah. Go ahead. One is distracted? In what way? Like she's always trying to get the house. Okay. What else? Uh, it says it right here. Jacob marries Leah. Yeah, Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. So they're married to the same dude, um, which is weird, right? Uh, okay. Can't one not have children? One can't have children and one can. Okay. Cool. So y'all are kind of familiar with Leah and Rachel. Um, let's flesh it out a little bit. So let's start in um, Genesis 29, verses 15, and moving forward. Okay, um, actually we're going to start in verse 16. And I'll read the first part and we'll go from there. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. So now what do we know about them? There are several things, multiple things in these verses. What do you guys look look at the Bible, look at the Bible, and tell me what you see about Leah and Rachel. What do you see? Leah had weak eyes. Leah had weak eyes. What else? Rachel was like pretty and had something Yes. Yes, Rachel was beautiful. What else? What's that? Leah was the older sister, yeah, and Rachel was the younger sister. What else? Not that one uses the word delicate. Delicate eyes, okay. Yeah. Rachel was loved by a boy. Yeah, Rachel was loved. And then there's one more thing about them. They were both daughters. Um, there's lots of facts about them in those verses, and we kind of get to know them a little bit. So Rachel was, Leah was older. Um, Rachel was younger. Leah's eyes were weak. Um, and when they talk about, sorry, I have a hair on me. It's making me crazy. Um, Leah's eyes were weak. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that she couldn't see. But they're actually talking about something the way she looks. Because when, um, when they talk about Rachel, they're talking about something the way she looks. So to have weak eyes, they're not exactly sure what that meant, but they think it was either her eyes were crossed or they were bulging out, like kind of like she couldn't really, you know, she was hard to look at. But, but Rachel was beautiful in form, which is talking about her body, and appearance, which is talking about her face. So she was gorgeous. Which one of these two sisters, if you had a choice, would you want to be? Would you want to be Leah or would you want to be Rachel? The one that was pretty? 
that what you said? What did you say? I would want to have a kind heart and not be, you know, well, does being beautiful mean that you're snotty? No. So we're so if heart take the heart out of it. Just when they talk about Lee and Rachel, they haven't talked about their hearts yet. So all so pretend all you know is about Lee and Rachel is yeah, right. We don't want to be Rachel, of course, duh. Um, why? Why do we all want to be Rachel? Every single one of us. If we had a choice between being Leah or Rachel, we all want to be Rachel. Why? Yeah. What's that? She's the pretty one. She's also the one that's loved. Um, there is in your heart, you, you are made to be uniquely special and loved and no one can take it away. That is what is in you and you can't get rid of it. That is the cry of your heart. You want to be uniquely special and loved and let no one can ever take that away. That's what you're wired for. So every single female on the planet wants to be Rachel. Um, that's why we love fairy tales and engagement stories. Like when a girl gets engaged, you know, you're like, oh, well, how did he ask you? Or when um, a guy's like super sweet to his girl, you're like, oh, that's so cute. We are wired to want that. We want to be chased after and loved and to have someone look at us and say, there's no one like you. You're the only one for me and I will always love you and no one will ever take that away. That's what you want. Um, I think that all of us have some Rachel moments where we feel special and some Leah moments where we don't. We feel second rate or whatever. And some of us have a lot of Rachel moments. Some of us have a few Rachel moments. Um, some of us don't have a lot of Rachel moments, but there is something that you count on to make you feel special. It could be that you are pretty, and that makes you feel special. It could be that you can sing, and you may not feel pretty, but when you sing, you feel so special. Or when you dance, or when you um, are on the basketball court and everyone knows that you're the best, you feel special. Um, when you can make everyone around you laugh, you feel special. So there's something about you um, that makes you feel special and that you count on. And I want you all to think about that one thing. Okay? It could be a couple of things, but I want you to think about the one thing that makes you special. People talk about identity, and that word to me, I'm like, I don't know what that means. When you say identity, it's like you saying, rah, 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 like, blah, 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 blah. I don't even, that's not even a word to me. It doesn't make sense. But when someone says to me, what do you count on that makes you special? I can kind of put my head around that a little bit better. Um, sometimes it's obvious. Like you know right away what you count on to make you feel special. Sometimes it's a little tricky. And there's a way to figure out what it is. Who is the girl that you just can't stand? Who is the girl that makes you crazy? Um... There was a girl when I was in junior high, specifically seventh grade. Um, in seventh grade, I was a runner, and I was a good runner. I um, was fast. I wasn't always the fastest, but I was fast. So sometimes I would win, sometimes I wouldn't. But there was this one girl, and her name was Mandy. And I don't know if her name is Mandy. It's a great name. But when I hear the name Mandy, this is how I hear it. Mandy. I could not stand Mandy. Do you know why? Because no one else really competed against me in running. I felt really comfortable, like I can win when I want to. Unless Mandy was running. And all of a sudden, sometimes I would win, and sometimes I wouldn't, but it was always against Mandy. And I couldn't stand her. Because she was taking the thing that I, that I counted on to make me feel special, and she, threatened me. Like, she sometimes would take it from me because she would win. So I always, I couldn't stand Bandy. So who is the girl you can't stand and why can't you stand her? What does she take from you? What does she threaten you with? There's a girl, maybe she um, is a little prettier than you are. Or maybe she, yes? What's that? Is this a rhetorical question? It's a very rhetorical question. Yes, you do not have to tell me. <laughs> You're like, she's in this room. I can't stand her. myself. Um, so no, it's totally a rhetorical question. But there is, if you can't think on your own, oh, this is what I'm counting on, then think of why do you not like that girl? And that's probably what you're counting on to make you feel special. That is 
what you are um, counting on. It's your identity, okay? Um, and you know what? Your identity changes. So right now in junior high, it's something. But when you're in college, it'll be something different. Moms, there are things that moms struggle with identity. Sometimes it's how great their kids are. Sometimes it's if they're the cute mom. Sometimes it's... Um, their career, or like uh, out of college, your career, if you have a good job or if you're good at your job. And you know what? When you're 90 years old, you're gonna have something that you feel like makes you special. And it's gonna be really dumb, like I have my teeth and all of my friends don't. Or I can walk and all of my friends can't. Like it's gonna be really something silly, but to them it's gonna be really important. You know, like when you're 90, if you have your teeth, I mean, that's, it's funny what we count on, but that's, old ladies count on something to make them feel special, right? So this is something you will have for the rest of your life. So that's why I'm talking about it today, because I want to give you tools. All right, so back to our story. Um, let's see. Verse 18, chapter 29, verse 18. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. And I want you all to realize, Jacob was looking at Rachel... If I could only have Rachel, I'll feel good about myself. Because Jacob was the Leah of his family. He was the son that was not favored. And he had to trick his way into being the favorite. So he was Leah. And he saw Rachel and he's like, man, I've been Leah my whole life. But if I could get that girl, that's what's going to make my life better. And he loved her and counted on her. Um, So he worked seven years for her. Usually people would pay the amount of money... It took for one year to, you know, you would pay the dad for the the daughter. He paid seven years of work for the daughter. So he really loved her. He really wanted her. Um, 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. So... Possible. Like, how are you going to trick a guy into marrying someone else? Well, back then, the girls wore all of these veils. They were very covered up. They would have the reception of the wedding lasted for days. And they were, you know, drink, like drinking wine and celebrating. And everyone's exhausted. And then they go to these dark tents to go home with no electricity. So it's really understandable that, like, you really could trick someone and put someone else, like, under the veils. And Leah, this is her wedding day. What do you think... She, her hope was. Like, if I could just what? What do you think she was counting on? To make her heart feel full? Yeah. What? Mary. Yes. Maybe Jacob will love me. If I could just get him married to me, maybe he'll love me. And then, the next morning, I mean, I wish I had like a soundtrack. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, like the next morning. Um, 25. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Jacob is mad. Okay. You're Leah. You wake up. You're hoping that he'll see you. And say, oh my gosh, what an awesome surprise. I married you. Um, <laughs> how do you think she felt that morning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awful. Awful. All of her hopes were if I can if I, I if I can marry him and maybe I'll if I'm just the perfect wife and the sweetest wife and I take really good care of him, maybe he'll love me <coughs> and make my heart feel full. So to make things even worse. Um, verse 26 Laban said um, I'm sorry verse 27 complete the week of this one Leah and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years Jacob did so and completed her week which is Leah's week then Laban gave his daughter Rachel to be his wife so Leah seven days after she gets married her husband turns around and marries the girl she, he really likes. I mean, I don't think I've ever been hurt like that. Um, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't survive. So 
So I know that this chick, who has never been loved her whole life, has always been in the shadow of Rachel, always second rate. Now she has to live the rest of her life sharing her husband with the woman she always felt second rate to. I mean, to me, that's a nightmare. Now, I want to um, point something out. So, there are stories, lots of stories, especially in the Old Testament, about men having multiple wives. And some people say, well, if it's in the Bible, like, why, doesn't, why does God let his people do that? Because Jacob is one of God's people. Why does God let his people do that? Does he think it's wrong? Does he think it's okay? Like, why would Christians do that back then? The Bible is very clear. Every story you ever read in the Bible about a man having two wives or more, it's a train wreck. It is awful. There is pain and there is um, disappointment. It's the same thing with slavery, with having a favorite son. Like, anytime you see a family that has a favorite son, um, there's always, always pain and disappointment. So when you see those things in the Bible, they're telling the story as it really is. They're not making it prettier or dressing it up, but they're also showing you it really ruins lives. So, um, okay, so let's go back to Leah. Um, Leah's one thing is if I could only have one thing, I could, if I could only have Jacob's love, I would, my heart would be full. And the reason we know that she thought this way is because in um, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, hated, not just not loved, but hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named his name Reuben. For she said, what did she say? Someone read it to me. Verse 32. For she said what? The Lord is Right. Reuben um, means to see. So she named her baby C. Maybe now my husband Jacob will see me. Maybe I won't be invisible anymore. But didn't work. So she has another baby. Um, she conceived again and bore a son and said, what did she say this time? Simeon. Simeon. And Simeon means hear. So maybe now Jacob will hear me. I have two babies. And babies are like the biggest deal ever. Um, I have two, for that for that culture. Um, I have two babies. Now maybe Jacob will hear me. Maybe he'll listen to me. But it didn't work. So she has another baby. Maybe this time it'll work. And what is Levi? The next baby is Levi. So what is this one? What does she say? Verse thirty-four. Who's got it? Go ahead. Read it real loud. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, "Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have." born him three sons. Right. So she named him Levi. Levi. So Levi means attach. Maybe this time my husband will attach to me. Maybe he'll love me now. Maybe I'll be lovable because of this baby. But the thing is, three babies in and still not working. She still doesn't feel special. Um, every kid brings a new hope. Well, maybe this time I'll feel special. And she doesn't. We do the same thing. Maybe this new group of friends will make me feel special. Maybe when I get to high school, I'll feel special. Maybe if I become the president of a club, I'll feel special. Maybe um, if I lose 20 pounds, I'll feel special. Maybe if I get the part of that play, I'll feel special. We always are hoping for the next thing. Well, maybe this will make me feel special. Maybe this will never go away. This will be the thing that makes me feel special, and I'll never have to worry about it again. But it's never enough. Um, she keeps having babies and keeps having babies, and it doesn't work. It doesn't fix it. Um, let's look at Rachel for a minute. So Rachel is gorgeous. She's got the guy. You think you'd be pretty happy, right? Mm -hmm. Like that should be enough. You got this happy, you know, happy marriage, and you're beautiful. What does someone read? Verse chapter thirty, verse one. Read it really loud. 
When Rachel saw that she was not bearing to Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sisters, and she said to Jacob, Give me children or I'll die. Give me children or I'll die. What is the one thing Rachel wants? Children. Yeah, if I could just have children. I'm gorgeous. I have a, a husband that loves me. He's worked seven years for me, which is a big deal. It's like seven times. He loves her seven times more than any other man loves his wife. Um, and it's not enough. Even if you're Rachel, it's not enough. Um, if I could just have babies. So, remember how we talked about yesterday? Whatever it is, that one thing, if you could just have it, it would make your life right and we'll do whatever it takes to get it. Look what Rachel does. I'm going to read this next part. Give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here is my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf that even though I might have ch- that even I may have children through her. So she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife and Jacob went into her. So Rachel was so convinced if I can just have babies my life, my heart will feel full. And so she, she takes control of the situation and she decides, hey husband, go sleep with this other woman and that will make things better. Our trying to control and get it, get whatever that idol is, ruins freedom and it ruins relationships. Um, so Rachel, the curse of Eve, tries to make it happen and it just becomes even messier. Um, so, finally, though, the piece of redemption in this story is Leah finally figures something out. She starts to realize, to God's grace, there's a God out there that will see her, that will hear her, and that will attach to her and love her, and that can never change. No one can take it away. So if someone will read chapter 29, verse 35. Go ahead, real loud. And she conceived again in Boris and said, Now I will pray, face the Lord. Therefore she called on the name of Judah, and she stopped it. Right. This time I will praise the Lord. Judah means praise. And um, I don't think that Leah got this and then lived the rest of her life perfectly content, feeling loved all the time. I do not think that's what happened. But I do think that um, she got it for a second. And she sees, okay, I can't do anything to make me feel permanently special. But there is a God that sees me, that hears me. I'm not invisible. I am loved. And no one can change that. Um, does this story mean that God loves ugly people and hates beautiful people? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that God chooses weak things to save the world. Judah becomes the great, 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 great grandfather of Jesus. And Jesus becomes Leah so that you could become Rachel. Jesus didn't come as a flashy, hot guy with lots of money to convince people that God loves them. Jesus came as a kid from poor family and he was not attractive because the Bible tells us that there was nothing in his countenance that would make us desire him. He became Rachel. Oh, no, no, no. He became Leah so that you could become Rachel. Um, in World War II, there was this couple, Henry and Mary, and I love to tell their story because it's so beautiful. Um, Henry was a soldier. Mary was just this girl from a small town, and every time the soldiers would come to their town, they'd throw them a big party to like encourage them and give them a night to forget the fact that they were in war. And so they'd have a big party with dancing and food. And so Mary, you know, and her girlfriends got all dressed up, and they made all the food, and they had this party. And Henry walks in the room. And he looks across the room and he sees this girl. And automatically he is in love. And sometimes that's how love happens, right? Love at first sight. Sometimes love is slow. 
and it happens over time. And I don't know how it's going to happen for you. But for them, this was their story. Love at first sight. So he goes over to her. They dance the whole night. Um, they, they're completely in love. They know right away that they're going to get married. So they have this whirlwind romance. They have this wedding, and they're just so happy, and everyone's thinking they have the perfect love. Um, and then he gets a letter that says, okay, Henry, it's time for you to go to France and fight in the war. So the night before he leaves, they're together, and she's just falling apart because there's no cell phones. There's no phone. Like, she can't call France. All they can do is write letters. She doesn't know if he's going to get hurt. She did not know if he's going to, you know, not make it back. So she's just falling apart. This is the love of her life. And he's gone to the store, and he's bought, and, um, bought this... Um, crappy little watch. It's not worth anything. It's dinky. It's, you know, probably just really cheap. But what he does is he says, okay, Mary, um, I'm going to set our watches to the same time. We're going to call it Henry time. And anytime you're wondering what I'm doing, just look at your watch and you'll know. Like, if it's 9 o'clock in the morning, you'll know I'm probably up at work. You know, if you want to know, you know, look at your watch and you can tell when I'm going to bed. And that way, we can stay close even though we're far apart. So they have these watches, and she wears it, and every day she looks at it, and it's like, oh, Henry's probably eating breakfast right now, or maybe he's, you know, doing this or doing that. Um, And she's able to stay connected with him. Well, Henry doesn't come back for more. And she spends the rest of her life. She never gets married again. He is the love of her life. She'll never love anyone as much as him. And she keeps this watch on for the rest of her life. What if... On, you know, she's old, she's, you know, going home to Jesus, and we're sitting, I'm sitting by her bedside, and she's telling me the story about the watch. And she says, Julia, here's the story about the watch. I want you to have it. And I take the watch, and I'm like, oh, Mary, thank you so much. And then I walk out of the room, and I throw it in the garbage. What would you say to me if you were my friend? What are you doing? Why? Why would it be like, why would you be so upset about this junky little watch? It means so much. Yeah, what does it mean? It means like love and stuff. It means love and stuff. No, it does. The watch means love. The watch was a love gift, and it represents this great, passionate, perfect love. You are the watch. You are a picture of the love between the Father and the Son. In John 17, it talks about how God takes his people and gives them to Jesus. You are a picture of this passionate love. And if you want to know who you are, if you want to know what makes you special, you're the watch. You're the love gift. That is your specialness, and no one can take it away. There is no Rachel that can walk in this door and change that about you. People talk about identity in Christ. And once again, I'm like, I don't even know what that means. That's what that means. Identity in Christ. You are the watch. You are the love gift between the Father and the Son, and no one can change it. Um, how does that change your life? Okay? So what? I'm the, I'm the love gift. So what? Well, it changes your life in two ways. First of all, when you know that no one can take that specialness away, you are free. You don't have to try anymore. You don't have to work so hard to find out a way to be special. You don't have to um, volleyball. You don't have to count on volleyball to make you special. You can just play volleyball. Um, You don't have to count on being smart or being good or being funny. You don't have to count on those things to make you special anymore. You're free. Um, You don't have to count on being beautiful. And one thing I want you guys to hear um, about being beautiful, do you know um, God has a plan for your body in redemptive history? And what I mean by that is this package, right? Whatever your package looks like, this is what this package looks like for for some reason. I don't know. This is what the package looks like. Some of you out there look at this package and hear my talk and hear my jokes and hear my personality and automatically you're like, wow, she's a cool chick. I would probably want to hang out with her if she lived in my town. Some of you hear my talk and look at my package and are like, I don't even care if I ever see that lady again in my life. And that is fine. That is fine. I will not 
Um, not every person will hear me and see me and attach to me. But some will. God uses this package for some people. And he will use your package and your personality and your gifts for some people. So you don't have to attach to everyone. You don't have to look a certain way. God has a plan for you and the package that you are designed in. That's freedom. It's freedom. Um, But also, knowing that you're the love gift and that you are completely and permanently loved gives you the freedom to love others. What's your name? Clara. Clara. What if I had five dollars? I said, here, Clara, here's five dollars. Take the five dollars. How did that feel? Great. I have five dollars, right? It's nice. What if I said, Clara, now you have to give five dollars to every single person in this room. You don't have enough, right? You only have five dollars. What if I gave Clara five hundred billion million trillion dollars and Clara had so much money that she was building houses made out of bricks of money and she had a swimming pool that was just full of dollar bills and she would just swim in dollar bills all day and was using fifty dollars for napkins because she just had so much money and I said Clara now I want you to give all of these girls five dollars be easy right I mean she'd be like shoot here's five hundred dollars but I got so much money I don't even care about money anymore In the same way, when you are permanently and irrevocably loved and you know it, you're able to love others. Let's go back to Mandy. Did I love Mandy? What were my feelings towards Mandy? Jealousy. Jealousy? What else? Was it warm and fuzzy? Yeah. I pretty much hated Mandy, okay? Let's be honest. Um, I'm a jerk. I did not love her. I did not appreciate her gifts. I hated her gifts. Um, but my little sister Rachel, my little sister Rachel, haha, I have a little Rachel in my life. Um, my little sister Rachel was a runner as well. But Rachel never lost a race. She was so stinking fast that when she ran, her ponytail was straight out. She was so fast, she never lost a race. And I loved Rachel. And I can look at her running and say, oh my gosh, that is so awesome. And I was able to celebrate Rachel because I loved her. And when you are free, when you know that there is more than enough love to go around and you don't have to fight for love, but you have it, you can give it away to the people around you. Um, The last thing, and y'all are going to get to go really early, um, but the last thing is, But Julia, I just don't feel it. I don't feel God's love for me. How can I feel it? How can I know it like you know it? Um, And honestly, some days I know it, and some days I don't, right? The big thing is, keep digging. You know the love of God is out there, and you know that he has love for you. So you keep digging. How do I dig? Conversations with other girls or other people. So the kingdom of God is like a sorority in some ways. And I don't know what y'all know about sororities. I don't know what you think about sororities. So I'm not even going to get into a conversation about that. But in sororities, there are sisters, sorority sisters. And then you have a big. And then you have a grand big. I can't remember what it's called, though. Anyway, I don't remember what it's called. What? And then you have a little. That's right. So it's like this whole sisterhood thing. And the kingdom of God is like that. You have your sisters. Y'all have each other. Then you have bigs, like me and your interns. And then you have your grand bigs, like the older women in the church. And then you have your littles. Um, And honestly, y'all, you got to tap into this, your relationships. Um, My big is actually in the room right now. Um, But you got to tap into this. There are some ladies in your church, and I really think that the kingdom of God is um, secretly run by little old ladies. These little old I'm serious. These little old ladies, some of them have lost children. Some of them have seen their husbands die, or their families die. Some of them have been sick for a really long time. And they know so much about what it means to love Jesus, and live with Jesus for a lifetime. Do not underestimate the little old ladies in your church. They are legitimate. Like, so anyway, um, so this idea of um, bigs, grand bigs, littles, tap into that. 
That's one way to feel the love of Jesus. Second way. So say I was coming back from the beach and I was super sandy and I'm like, I just want to be clean. So I turn on the shower and I just look at it and I'm like, oh, I really want to be clean. I really, really want to be clean. And eventually, if I want to be clean, I just have to get under the shower, right? And be clean. Because this is our shower. <laughs> that was weird. Um, yeah. Julia, I really want to know God. I really want to know God. I really want to know his love for me. Eventually, you're going to have to get under the word. And I don't know if that for you that's reading the Bible or hearing the Bible taught, but you got to get under the word if you want to know about the love of God. Um, time with God. Pray. And pray, pray for yourself. God, show me how much you love me. Um, here's a verse. It's Ephesians 3, verses 14 and through the rest of that little chapter. But I'm going to read it to you because I want you to know what I've been praying for you since I found out I was going to teach this class this year. So know this is a prayer that you can pray for yourself. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family on heaven and earth is named, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you, grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. This is the part I want you to hear. That is just setting this up. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Pray it for yourselves. God, I want that. Show me, show me, show me. Um, and then the last thing is you have to retell it to your heart all the time. Heart, this is what is true about you. Y'all, I woke up this morning and did not believe this. Okay? I woke up this morning and did not feel like God was for me. And I had to tell it to myself. And then I texted my friends and said, Friends, I don't believe it. I need you to pray for me that I would feel the love of God this morning. So even as a teacher and as a grown-up, I don't feel it every day. Um, we have to retell our hearts and our minds. I know what you feel right now, but it's not as true as the Word of God. And His love for you never changes. All right. Y'all are distracted. We're going to go home. Let me pray. Let me pray. Everybody sit down. We're going to pray. All right. Jesus, thank you so much for your love. And I do ask that you would open our, heart, our eyes. We would not know it. We cannot know it unless you come and be with us and show us. Hey, come and be with us and show us that you are for us and that you love us. It's your name of prayer. Y'all are dismissed.